Hi everyone, this is Laura Hammock from the Marble Jar channel, and in today's video, I'll talk about the latest viral video game, Fortnite Battle Royale, why it is so addictive, and what as parents we can do about it. So my son just turned 16, and around last Halloween, he scraped together some money, and he bought himself an early Christmas present, a PlayStation console. That is when he fell over the Fortnite addiction cliff. I didn't quite understand the impact until a couple of months later when every single one of his grades had fallen by at least a full letter grade and he was walking around with huge bags under his eyes. It's highly addictive, way more fun than schoolwork, and tough on a high school sleep schedule. We had to make some changes. But before we talk about this, let's talk about Fortnite and why it's so addictive. So first, let's just cover the Fortnite basics. It's loosely based on the Hunger Games premise. You and 99 other people parachute into a world and then battle to the death. Whoever is the last one standing is the winner. You also get significant brag points by finishing close to the top of the 100 players. Fortnite encourages engagement with other players by shrinking the world geographically as the game goes on. You start out with full health points, which you lose by getting shot or falling off of stuff. And you can regain health points by using shields, which are like magic potions or medical kits. You find the shields along the way in treasure chests or pick them up from people that you've killed. In addition, you have to find weapons and ammunition to use, and you have to collect building supplies to construct defensive forts, thus the name of the game, towers or ramps. The object of the game is to kill the other players and be the last player standing at the end of the game, or as they call it, Victory Royale. So, why is it so addictive? So it's clear that video game developers are getting much smarter about what makes a sticky game. A sticky game is one that is hard to quick and that players come back to day after day. So here are a couple of the elements that make Fortnite a raging success in this respect. It's appealing and fun. So on the face of it, Fortnite sounds like any other shooter game, but it's not. It is more fun and it takes itself way less seriously. So instead of a gritty and realistic aesthetic like Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto, Fortnite employs a colorful, cartoony look that is super appealing. The named locations in the world are all strikingly different, but more importantly, the characters themselves are really fun. The developers deliberately chose a third-person shooter perspective, so that means that instead of looking down the barrel of a gun, you are looking at your own avatar, so that they could build more fun and more ways to spend money into the game. So you can buy or earn new skins for your character, some of which are completely silly or absurd. So this is my son's favorite skin. His favorite backpack is shaped like a bow, but he likes to wear that when he's using a hyper-masculine skin. It just gives a lot of opportunities for silliness and irony. And then, of course, there are the dances. You can buy dances for your character, and they can dab, do the floss, and any other number of hilarious and silly dances that they communicate to the other players. So not surprisingly, these dances bleed back into real life as these teenagers learn them from their avatars. It's free, but not really. So it's totally free to get started in Fortnite. And sure, there are kids who manage to keep it a free experience, but it is highly tempting to use real money to buy virtual stuff for your, for your Fortnite experience. New skins, new accessories, and new dances. And even the way that purchases are structured are addictive. So my son bought the seasonal pack, which is $10, but in order to unlock all the goodies of that pack, you had to play a lot to move up all the tiers, and each one unlocks new elements. Multiplayer. So game developers know that this is the key to game addiction. Video games are no longer a solitary pursuit. Fortnite allows you to play solo, but it also has duo and squad modes where you can play with friends as a team. So in duo mode, 50 teams are dropped into the world, and then you communicate via headsets to protect each other, to gang up on others, and to manage each other's health points. So not only are you hanging out with friends, but you are working together in this super appealing world. Lose by a little, win by a lot. So game developers are using gambling psychology to make their games sticky. This game has a higher than average, just one more mentality. So here is a Reddit post that sums it up. It's one of those games where you say, okay, one more game, and then you die. Okay, that one didn't count. Then you play like six more games and get a win. All right, let's try to get back-to-back -back wins. Then it's 5 a.m. 
and how have they created this drive to keep playing? So I got much of this from an internet article that I'll reference in the notes section. As slot machine psychology tells us, players who know that they were very close to winning will play the slots again quicker than those who believe that there was less chance of a big pay payout. So in Fortnite, when you are killed, the very first thing you see is the health points of the guy who killed you. So many times his points are super low. What this means is, as you are killed and leaving the game, you are thinking, man, I was so close to killing that guy when he killed me. In many of the gun battles, the makers of Fortnite ensure that the winner only wins by a hair. And that makes you want to re-up for another game immediately. So this is the psychology that made Candy Crush such a phenomenon. In addition, the game winners only average about five kills per game. So at any given time, you could win big. Psychologically, the game is rigged to keep you coming back for more. Parents, what do we do about Fortnite? It's not all bad. So I am not someone who thinks that video games are a scourge upon society. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of gory first person shooter games. I put off getting these until my parenting logic started to totally fall apart. <laughs> but Fortnite is not a first person shooter game and it's not gory at all. So I think video games can stimulate your brain and can encourage a different kind of socialization. I'm always impressed at this generation's ability to plunk down in the middle of a game of any sort without any instructions and figure out what to do and how to get to the next level. It requires a flexibility of thinking that my generation hasn't really been trained to do. Play with your kids. So I'm busy, we're all busy, I don't really have the time or the inclination to sit down and play hours of video games with my kids. So that said, I think it's really important to understand the worlds that they are immersing themselves in. For several summers in a row, I would try out whatever game the kids were playing. I became hopelessly addicted to the Nintendo DS Lego series, and my son refused um, to play Dragon City with me anymore after I got too obsessed and competitive. So fortunately, I have no talent at all for shooter games, so I'm less likely to get hooked. But let's face it, 16-year-old boys are notoriously tough to find common ground with. I find that knowing a little something about his interests makes our relationship so much richer. Plus, he will love showing you how to play the game with him as the expert. My son actually had to leave the room a couple of times because I was just so bad when I was playing. <laughs> Roles. Knowing how addictive this game is makes it clear that there have to be rules around when and how long they can play. Otherwise, it will always be more appealing than homework, family dinner, or really anything else. So I'm not one of those smug parents that will suggest that this will be easy. It will not be easy. Enforcing the rules can trigger full toddler style meltdowns. My only piece of advice is to hang in there. It should get a little easier after the rules have been established and in place for a while. Our rules is that there is no PlayStation during the weekdays and playtime is earned on the weekends by things like good study habits and chores being done. Enforcement. Almost every game console has a way of setting time limits and parental controls. At some point, I will probably look into using those. I have a kid who will figure out a way around most tech solutions. So right now, I'm using a low-tech combination lockbox. I will stick the entire PlayStation console in here on Mondays and it doesn't come out until Friday. The other thing is with Fortnite, setting strict time limits might actually increase emotional volatility. Fortnite is played game by game. If the PlayStation goes dead in the middle of the game, we would have a full blown meltdown on our hands. The problem for me is when they say just another five minutes to finish the game, I have to stay on top of that. I use timers to remind myself, or sometimes I'll just sit and watch the remainder of the game to make sure that he turns it off afterwards. So I'd love to know what has worked for you. Comments are always appreciated, and thanks for watching.